This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. So today, uh, the Plein Air podcast, we're recording live at the Plein Air convention. We've got a live audience. <laughs> and today, our guest is Haiti Jo Summers from, uh, from the UK. Welcome. Hi, thank you. It's nice to have you here. It's nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, why, why did you come all the way over here from the UK for the Plein Air Convention? That's a big hassle. Yeah, I, I mainly come here to see my American friends. Yeah, yeah you have friends. That's I right. have a few friends. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's lots of so many artists gathered here from all over America, so you can always see a load of nice people Absolutely. that you know and meet nice new people. And, yeah, I love it. So I'm curious about, uh, we're going to talk about you and your career and how you got where you are, and we'll probably talk about some painting tips and so, a lot of different things. But... I'm kind of curious about what's happening with Plein Air. We have, this podcast is uh, now in about 120 countries. We've had two, two and a half million downloads. Uh, it's very curious to me because we have listeners all over the world. Yeah. And uh, we are hearing about pockets of Plein Air painting happening all over the world. And I'm curious, uh, we know that uh, there's a, a couple of major events, especially a major event happening in Ireland. Mm -hmm. But could you talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing happen at the in, in terms of the um, uh, plein air movement uh, over in Europe or perhaps in, in the a UK? A little bit in the UK, yeah. So I think it's only really 12, 13 years ago that things started, you know, events really started in the UK. And we have a few plein air competitions and events on the festival in Ireland, mm -hmm. um, of course. In Wexford. It's, it's a fun one. Yeah, in Wexford. But we don't have quite the scene that you have here. But it's, it's definitely become hugely popular in the UK amongst painters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I understand it's growing. And I, I understand it's growing exponentially in some areas like Spain, for instance. Oh. I had no idea, but there are dozens and dozens and dozens of events uh, and with some pretty large prizes. Um, Pablo Rubin told me about that. So um, was plein air painting always a part of your life? Um, not particularly. I mean, we never called it plein air painting, but we might paint outside a bit in summer, uh -huh. you know? <laughs> yeah. um, but then in 2010, I lived on an island in France and yeah. it was a very, very small island. And no cars, I wasn't teaching, and I didn't have any other distractions. It was a pretty island, and that's when I particularly started painting outside. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, I was, I was having a fond memory flashback, because the first time we met, we met in France. We did, you, in Nice. Uh, you heard I was going to be in France, and you came over with your husband, and, and uh, that was the first, first chance. And, and that was, I'm trying to remember what year that was, that was probably 2018 or 19. It was, yeah, it was a while ago, yeah. Because I, yeah. I was leading a group. We have these fine art tours that we do. And I think that's the last one we did because we had to stop with COVID. We're starting up again this October. We're going to, to Madrid and to Stockholm. But okay, uh, to Madrid, you're going to go to the Soroya Museum. We're going to go to the Soroya Museum. Amazing. We're going to go to the, all the museums, really. And we go behind the scenes. We go to artists' homes. And sometimes we have... Um, chances to meet with curators and museums. We, we have, for instance, we, we went behind the scenes at the Van Gogh Museum when we were uh, in Holland, and uh, they passed a Van Gogh painting around for us to hold in our hands. I mean, how rare is that? And we, went to, we were in Budapest, we went to Alphonse Muka's home, his daughter-in-law yeah, was amazing. 90, 
two at the time let us into his home yeah. and to see their family private collection of his paintings that no one's ever seen. Awesome. You know, so we do a lot of things like that. I know. It's I'll join cool. you one day. All right. That'd be cool. We'd like that very much. <laughs> so uh, how did this whole journey begin for you? Uh, first memories of thinking about becoming an artist? Well, I've always been kind of considered myself an artist. I went straight from school to art college, university, studied illustration started teaching and painting, exhibiting, worked at picture framers. It's quite a long, <laughs> uh, a long career, but as well as having a couple of kids and being mom and being at home looking after the kids and stuff. Um, so it's really, but really that year in France was a big turning point because that's when I, I reluctantly joined Facebook like 15 years after everyone else had. No. <laughs> He's, um, We're all regretting I don't it. like the idea of doing something that everyone else is doing, you know. <laughs> um, and the art blogs and all that. I discovered the whole online scene. Well, you've become quite masterful at your whole <laughs> online thing. Well, Instagram seems to be, seems to have been a happy place yeah. for me, yeah. Um, and it just connects you with artists all over the world. Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have known about you and Plan Air magazine and... I thought everybody did. If I hadn't have gone online, if uh, I'd have stayed off, off grid. <laughs> well, you know, our most famous subscriber happens to live in your country. Yeah, that will be king our king, yes. our new king, Charles. Yes. So the yeah. story on that is that um, Joan Rivers and I knew each other. She was a comedian. Yes. And uh, she called me one day and she said, um, I don't know if you, I knew her from the radio industry, and she said, I don't know if you know this, but she said, I'm a subscriber to Plein Air Magazine. I said, I didn't know you were a painter. She <laughs> says, yeah. She said, um, uh, Charles and I go out all the time painting, and she said, I bought him a subscription to your magazine, and I've been paying for it for years. And so when she died, I was curious what would happen, whether or not a renewal would come in. Yes. It did. It did. It did. Now, it's to the right. same address, and by the way, it was not an address that was visible. In other words, you know, nobody else would know who that is. But we've, we've got a couple of famous subscribers, which is kind of fun. Next time I'm having tea at the palace, I'll just look around and see if there's a copy yeah. sitting there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I tried, I reached out to try to go painting with him. Mm -hmm. um, this is before he became really busy. I mean, yeah, much busier. He's, <laughs> he's always been busy. <clears throat> and I got a really beautiful rejection letter. Oh, nice. <laughs> Something to frame and hang in the nah, downstairs. Nah, well, it's, not for, it's not signed by him. It's signed <laughs> by his secretary, which is probably still a big deal. But. Yeah. So, um, so you said it changed your life. Um, yeah. It changed your tra trajectory. Was it getting outdoors that made a difference in your painting? Being outdoors it? and also being a little bit isolated and cut off yeah. in France because then I really enjoyed making the connections online uh -huh. with other artists over here and stuff. Um, and then when I went back to the UK to live, I was determined to enter competitions and that's what happened. I won a, I won a prize very soon after I got back to the UK which was called the Artist of the Year. I mean, it was just quite, a, you, know, you know, lots of entries and... Is that a TV show? Uh, no, it was a competition. Uh -huh. um, and I won, and then I was invited to paint the Queen's Diamond Jubilee River pageant in London, and that all happened within the first six months of being back in the UK. And then what happens with your career is you win something and then somebody suggest something else and then you get an offer from somebody else and things just start to snowball. It's called momentum. Momentum. Well, mm -hmm. momentum really built up for me, yeah, 2011, 2012, 2013. Yeah, even though I'd been painting since I graduated in like the mid 90s, but it was only in the last 10 years that things have really... I get that. Up. So yeah. I, I, I sat down with Kimball, uh, who won the yes. Plein Air Salon Award this year, and I said, I want to coach you and tell you how your life is about to change when you win this award. And he's a very sweet man. And I said, um, first off, your prices are going to increase dramatically, and uh, within 24 hours of winning that prize, 
he got a call from one of the top five galleries in America, and they invited That's him. That's awesome. In. So, I, and I, and he hadn't known that yet. And I said, "This That's is going to cool. happen. You're going to hear mm -hmm. from galleries. You're going to hear from competitions. You're going to hear from people who want you to do workshops. You're going to yeah. hear from, and and it snowballs. It does. And so that's. Yeah kind of what happened to you. Yeah, absolutely. Since then, I've written a couple of books. I've filmed DVDs. I'm, I became a member of the Royal Institute of Oil Painters, and now I'm the vice president. So well, that's a big deal. Things <laughs> so can you talk to me about that organization and, and kind of the meaning of that in the UK? Because that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, so it's a really old society. I, should, I should know, but you know, like 150 years old or something. So kind of about my age. <laughs> And uh, when I was a young artist, I won a Young Artist Award. Uh -huh. So they have an annual show that anyone can send work in and maybe have it selected and hung. Um, I entered as a young artist. I won an award a couple of times, actually. And then from then on, all I ever wanted was to become a member. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was my only kind of career goal or dream, even. As soon as I came across this society of artists who are all passionate about oil painting and exhibiting at the Mal Galleries, which is just down the road from Buckingham Palace. It's a fabulous gallery. And it was just so exciting to be a part of that all I ever wanted after that was to become a member. It took me a long time. I exhibited for probably, you know, 15 years or more mm -hmm. with them before I became a member. So the lesson in that for all of us is what? It's if there's something you want, you should just be persistent. You've just got to keep plugging away. Yeah, because I mean, many people give up. It's very competitive, even to get a painting accepted. And many people get discouraged. Um, but it, that year in France, when I was away and I couldn't enter, I, I was just determined after that, that I was never going to miss a year. And I was going to just keep on entering until I was elected a member. Yeah, if there's something you really want, you should just keep going. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you you said earlier that you painted the Diamond Jubilee. Yeah. Um, what was that like? That was funny, because it was in June and the weather was terrible, and I bought a dress specially because the BBC were filming. Um, there were a dozen artists on the Millennium Bridge that they'd selected. Uh, different, you know, oil painters, watercolor, somebody with an iPad, somebody was even painting on a door, hmm. a full-size door. Hmm. Hmm. And <laughs> um, I thought this is a special occasion, it's going to be filmed, it's, it's going to be on the BBC. And you were, where you were painting the stage? Looking the down coronation. over the river. Yeah. There was this big pageant with all kinds of different boats and the Queen and Prince Philip were on one of them and we were just to paint the boats as they came down the river. It's hard to do that when they're moving. Well, it's, it's hard to do that, yeah. And uh, I had to bought this dress specially because it was going to be lovely. And it was so cold and wet on the day that I had a fleece, I had a coat, I had a woolly hat. I just like... <laughs> <laughs> All That's the, elegant, the right? only people, I know it was gorgeous, the only people who could stay painting were the oil painters. Everyone else was, they were just dropping like flies. It was like, you know, the iPad guy, the watercolors, lady with acrylics, and they were just like running down the canvas. I had an umbrella on my oils and I just kept painting and I had a little like chat to Annika Rice on TV, but um, you know, the funny thing about that was that people were then messaging me from Australia and America and, and lots of people had seen it, oh, that's sending wonderful. me Facebook messages and things. So did that build your social media up considerably? Yeah, I think I had a blog at that time. It was in the blogging days. Yeah, yeah I think that helped. You yeah. don't blog anymore? No. Please nobody look for my blog because it's still on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, find me on Instagram, please. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it seems so 1980s, doesn't it? <laughs> I still do a blog, like I said. Well, yours is great. Thank so, you. Yeah. Sunday no. coffee. Uh, yeah. yeah. Love it. Sure you read you it every week. You, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, the Instagram is great because it's just so instant. That's why it's good for artists. You, you paint something and you can just pop it on there the same day. And I think your followers feel like they're such a part of your life because they know where you are. Yeah. You know, I, I bump into someone in London. They say, oh, so you've just been to Spain. How was it? And I, for a second, I think, how did you know? And yeah, then it feels like, a little yeah. creepy. Everybody so. knows. <laughs> it's not Instagram, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you come here to the convention and you see faces that you've never met, but you feel like you know them yeah. because you've interacted with them or watched them on social media. It's fabulous. You do. It is. And I think the great thing about social media is that you, you can build these connections and you do end up meeting everybody at some point in person. I do. <laughs> I meet everybody in the end. Well, you might, you've got a lot of followers. Right? That might not be physically possible. <laughs> yeah. So you... Um, uh, you, you got the queen coming down in a boat. Oh, gosh. And it's raining. Yeah. The queen's probably indoors because it's cold. No, the poor things, they were out there on the front of the boat. Were they yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was funny. I mean, I painted kind of the buildings and the river first before yeah. the boats came and just did, just did my best. Yeah. Yeah. How'd it come out? <laughs> okay. I mean, it was a record of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so you regularly painted. I wouldn't right want to see it now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so tell me what your responsibilities are. You're the vice president of the Royal Institute of Oil Painters. Yeah. So what does the vice president do? That's st I'm still to find out. Oh, <laughs> it's uh, only been a month or so. Oh, really? Um, it's brand new. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, but it's a great society. We've got people like Trevor Chamberlain and David Curtis. Ken Howard is recently past, but, um, you know, all of the, the top, well, inspirations to us, younger painters, and we've got loads of fantastic younger painters coming in. So coming do they have to... meetings, like you guys sit around and drink yeah. beer? And... <laughs> yeah, well, we have council meetings, and we, we just run the society between us with the help of the Mal Galleries. Yeah. yeah. Well, though, you mentioned a couple of big names that we need to get here to the plenary convention oh may or gosh. may not happen. David, yeah. David might. David, Trevor, come out Trevor, I've, I've tried for years, but he's getting up there. He's getting elderly, oh. yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. brilliant. He's brilliant great. Painter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for I'll, sure, I'll have to go sure. over there and do a live interview and then put it on the stage. That, would be, that would be wonderful, yeah. yeah. You can come and see my studio as well, okay. anytime. I'll do that. <laughs> and where do you live? What part of the UK? I live in Lincolnshire, which is very rural. It's in the middle on the east on the east side. Uh -huh. It's easy to get to London on the train. It's like an hour to London, but it's also completely quiet and peaceful. There's just yeah. fields and yeah. it's nice. So you, you obviously make your living as an artist. Yes. Um, you have no other form of income. No. And <laughs> Don't make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I am going to probe that a I've little further. I've got two paintings so for get sale out there. Up here. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, how, how do you make a living as an artist? You have, uh, are you in galleries? Mainly, mainly painting sales, uh, yeah. and then uh, teaching, and the, the some money from the books and things. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, galleries, direct sales. A few galleries. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say mainly direct sales, but also gallery sales. Yeah. yeah. And are you getting any um, sales or activity off of Instagram? Yes, yeah, lots. Yeah, how does yeah. that work for you? I mean, what do you do that, do people just say, hey, can I buy this? Or do you say yeah, this yeah, is available? Yeah, yeah, so you'll just get, a, I, I just post my work and then somebody will message, direct message usually and say, uh -huh. is that one for sale? Yeah. And I'll and, say, yes, it definitely is. <laughs> so have you have you got the one that says, says hi, I, I'm try, I love your paintings and I'm, my wife NFT. and I are having oh. a special anniversary, and I know I, that off by yeah. heart. That one. Yeah. Do you guys mm -hmm. know that scam? Yeah. Perusing yeah. your works. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I get it. I I, I always say um, my artwork is. I always respond. And I say my artwork is always avail, available on this website, FBI.gov. <laughs> And I, I was hoping they'd stop oh. sending them, but they keep sending them. Now it's, and, and now unfortunately, it's the NFTs. a lot of artists fall for the scam and end up sending them. You know, they send the money and then they somehow they, I don't know how it I works. I mean, if somebody doesn't address you by your name to start with, you know, they send you a generic email and it's like not saying, dear Eric, that's not a good sign at yeah. the beginning. Yeah. And then their grammar's usually really bad. And then you see the same sentences over and over again. Yeah, but I do all those things. But if, <laughs> but if someone's not sure, if they receive an email and they're not sure if it's maybe genuine or if it's a scam, I suggest just um, cutting a section of the email, pasting it into Google, 
and you'll see it will pop up because it's already on there. It's, it's already on there. Millions of people have already received it, and then you go, oh, yeah, that's a scam email. Yeah. It's sad. Okay. Well, I just got scammed online recently. <laughs> I'm not very happy about it, but I should have done that. But it wasn't about selling art. So um, talk to me about plein air painting in terms of, you know, what percentage of your time, are there seasons, uh, you know, you've got a rainy, well, so, your yeah, rainy paint, season is all the time. Rain, <laughs> I paint all year now, Do you? all year rounds, yeah. You, yeah. No matter how cold it is, you're out there? Yeah, I mean, I'm usually in a nice place though, like, so I was in Seville for a week in nice. February and... Um, I love this. We love the snow in the UK. I think all plein air painters in the UK love the snow because it's so rare and we don't get enough. Yeah. So I'd really like to come over here and paint some proper snow. Proper snow. <laughs> like, like the proper like snow deep in Colorado. Snow, you know? yeah, so you actually, this week in Colorado, you can see some proper snow. Yeah. Just have to get a little higher. <laughs> but you can see it from down here. That's assuming we weren't having the smog coming from Canada from the wildfires. I know. I, it was the same in Santa Fe last year, if you remember. Yep. Now yeah, there were the fires there. <clears throat> so that's because we're hot. Can I tell you? The uh, <laughs> well, I'm sure the Colorado artists. There's some water right there for you. The Colorado artists here could probably tell you how to get to some snow. Hmm. So you're going to be here painting extra days. That'll be nice. So um, what's your? Do you have like a something that you're iconically known for in terms of what you paint? Sorry, <laughs> tickly. <coughs> um, I think I'm known for painting kind of intimate scenes, maybe as well the kind of things that people don't normally see as painting subjects. Give me an example. Huh. Um, like, a, like laundry on a line. Yeah. Like one of the Planet Salon entries that won one of the monthly awards was... Um, my neighbor's washing line. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the kind of thing. L a little domestic subject. I tend to hone in on a small motif rather than a grand. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why you landed on that? Is there something that you, you know. discovered or <clears throat> learned that helped you get there? You know, when I was a teenager, I used to read the, all of the Jane Austen books. Mm -hmm. And she said, you should write about what you know. She said... Um, she wrote about the things that she knew and didn't try to write about anything that she didn't know. And she so said, you were doing a lot of laundry with two kids. She said, <laughs> yeah. she said, this little piece of ivory on which I write, two inches wide, and it just stuck with me all the years. I just thought I, I better paint about things that I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like gardens and kitchens and not, I mean, I love Western art, but I don't, I haven't associated with any cowboys yet, so I just stick to the kind of the normal English things that, mm -hmm. that I see, that I, I know. I think it's really pretty good advice, yeah. actually. Yeah, and uh, you've just got to paint what interests you personally and not try to be overly, overly influenced by what everybody else is painting. Uh, so there are certain themes, like the laundry theme and allotments, which are like kitchen gardens. And there are certain themes like that that I've been interested in since I was like 18. You know, I just keep coming back to. Now, do you try to, do you have a story in mind when you're painting? Is it what's going through your head in terms of when you're creating your composition? Are you, you, you know, 100 years from now, are the curators going to make up some bogus story about what you were thinking? Or are you just like, I think that's cool, I'll paint it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, well, 100 years from now, if this, if this podcast still exists in the ether, then... I think that's good. It, it's usually an effect of the light. Um, it's just so striking. Something if something strikes me, yeah. So what's your process like when you first... You, you're going out somewhere. You're, you're going to Seville. Mm -hmm. You're wandering around trying to find something that, that interests you. Yeah, that's you. what I do, exactly. So I'm not big on planning. Yeah. And I wouldn't like to go to a place and kind of pre-plan what I'm going to paint when I get there. Yeah. I'd much rather see what's, how it is on the day, what the light's doing, and look for something that interests me. Okay, mm. so you, you find something that speaks to you. Mm. And what do you do then? Do you do a sketch? Do you start No, out? I just start straight with my oils. Uh -huh. 
So I, what I'd really like to do one day is take a trip just with my sketchbook and pencils and leave the oils at home, but I just keep... You look a little nervous about that. Nervous about that, yeah, because, you know, like within two days, I'd be like, I wish I'd brought that. <laughs> yeah, no, I love the idea of doing that. But, um, yeah, no, I, I just, I'm always with the oils, you see, so I think it's good to break out of your comfort zone. And maybe, I mean, maybe I'll take gouache or something. But, um, yeah, then I just set up and paint for a couple of hours, two, three hours, and then I need a snack or a drink or... Both. Or beer, or <laughs> meet with a friend, or something. Yeah. yeah. So typically, if you're on on a painting trip, or you is your optimum getting one painting a day? Two. Or two. Yeah. And are you pretty much a morning and afternoon light person? Yeah, I'm not particularly an early riser. <laughs> and in the evenings, I like to eat dinner with friends if there's anyone. If yeah. there's anyone else. So you're painting at high noon. Basically what you're painting at, in the morning and then having a break and then painting again. Yeah, yeah it seems quite lazy to only manage two, but I used to try for, try for more, but I think the quality takes a dip if I'm trying for three, four paintings in a day. Yeah. Although in my book I did try, this was fun, a fun for a try, yeah, if you're, if you're bored and you want to try something, I did 10 paintings in a day. Did you really? Yeah, it was really quite fun, actually. Were they like postage stamps? They were like sort of eight by eight. Yeah. 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 And, and do you prefer to paint small most of the time? I do paint pretty small. Yeah, like 12 by 16 and under oh, sort good. of size because, because I'm usually just doing one session. Uh -huh. Something I'd like to do more of is work larger outside and to go back repeatedly and do two, three sessions. So are you typically um, a direct painter? You know, you're doing an underpainting, you're just laying paint on, what just would you? Just straight on with the paint. Yeah, what's the first thing you do? So if it's architecture, I'll usually do a bit of a, 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 ske a, a guideline sketch yeah, of so position, like, the, position the main shapes with my brush. Try to get your perspective figured out. Just get it all positioned on there, really. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And then just try to get on with uh, color and tone as quickly as possible, like a blocking, I suppose, and then go back and refine. So do you do like the thin wash first, or you just start out with? Not really. I prefer it if I've already put a thin wash on the boards back in the studio, and they, then they already have some kind of tint. Yeah, I prefer that, but sometimes I'm out with a white panel and then I do just just rub something on quickly like um, like raw sienna or something mm -hmm. yeah okay so that's you're looking for kind of a brown tonal effect on your yeah other. I like warm I don't know why but I'm, I'm drawn towards towards a warm gray that's my ideal so you do a lot of teaching I do a fair bit of teaching yeah, yeah. what uh, what are the things that you find you're most able to help people with? What are the things that they're struggling with that you really would say is your superpower at helping recognize and help them solve? Well, I, I, maybe, I hope I'm good at helping people with, um, with, with direct brush strokes. Uh -huh. Yeah, a lot of people f fuss and, and blend and they lose you know, they may have a good tonal, they may have good tonal value relationship going on, but then they lose it by constantly noodling. Noodling. <laughs> it's a great word, noodling, isn't so it? So, I hope I might help with that. So, but, what do you tell them to do instead? Uh, I think that, but just by watching me, the way I put it down and then lift the brush off makes them think they can maybe be more decisive. So, with the marks. thick is it pretty thick? Pretty thick. Yeah. yeah. So, like, how big are your piles of paint when you put them up? Actually, I don't, um, I don't know. I don't pre mix. So, yeah. uh, you know, I don't know. Square inch. Yeah. yeah. About that. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, and then, what are the, some of the other things that you find students are struggling with? They struggle with, with drawing. Drawing. Yeah. yeah. What's your best recommendation on that? 
to practice drawing. <laughs> so practice drawing for like five, ten minutes a day and make it a regular habit. Yeah. Just with a pencil and paper. Yeah. Anything from life, anything at all, just, just a, a regular practice is all you need. Yeah. Some great books I can recommend on drawing as well. What are they? So there's the drawing on the right side of the brain one. Betty Edwards. Betty Edwards. And there's a Danny, Danny Gregory book called The Creative License. That's a really fun one. Creative. License. License. It's a really fun book. You know, if people are reluctant to draw because they think it's serious or daunting, that's a really great fun book to get okay. people started with drawing. Okay. Tell me about your book. You did, oh, you've I, got two books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are they? So the first one is called Vibrant Oils, and it's a general kind of oil painting book. Yeah. Um, and the second one is plein air painting with oils, plein air painting in oils. Okay. Yeah. Which so I had at how the... did your life change when you became an author or did it? I don't know. I did a demo for you last year on the main stage and there my, you go. my book was in the shop there. So that was <laughs> nice. And at the end of the demo, people came to the stage and I signed the book. Yeah. That was fun. That's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah. But I think the book is also like a nice record of where your work was at that time. Right. So I'm thinking about a possible third book now, and it's not like every three or four years a new book would be quite nice because <laughs> looking back. Well, um, it's like what C.W. Mundy like said history. on stage this morning. You know, he said, I've learned so much mm -hmm. since I did my last video that this, this incorporates all my learning. And if you look at it, you, you could buy like an old Richard Schmidt book on, on uh, eBay or something, and you look at how much has work changed even since he wrote that book? I mean, sure. the people are always hopefully growing. Hopefully, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So the book is a nice record, really. It's a nice. It's also very inexpensive. You know, people can pick that up on Amazon for like I don't know, twelve dollars or something. So, yeah. it's it's the books give lots of information, lots of inspiration, tons of photos of my paintings, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. I, I mean, I love them. I collect them. I have hundreds of yeah. art books. Yeah, it's a, it's a sickness we all do. <laughs> yeah. So the, um, uh, we have a lot of people who are at different levels listening to this right now. Um, one question that people are always sending is, how do I get to the next level? So there's, there's mm. that question, there's how do I find my voice? Mm. And then there are people who are already at a relatively high level that are trying to figure out how do they push themselves even higher, what would you tell these people? Mm, it's really, it's the same old advice over and over again, isn't it? But you have to keep putting your work out there and putting yourself out there. And I know it's hard if you're, if you're an introvert. I'm an introvert. <laughs> Here you are on stage in front of all these people. Yeah. <laughs> I am, but these people are my tribe, you know, yeah. so... Um, when I started doing demos for art clubs, I used to be really nervous, but that was like 20 years ago. And the first couple of times I was really nervous, you know, like really anxious. Like butterflies. Yeah. And then one day I just realized I was on my way to a demo and I thought, oh, hey, I, I can't go wrong here. This is, a it was a big realization. I can't go wrong because they're actually just there to watch me paint the way I paint. Right. So however the painting turns out, that's, that's, they've watched me paint. That's yeah. how I do it. And if, even if it goes wrong, because it goes wrong for all of us, right? Then even if things go badly, then they're seeing you, your thought process and they're seeing that sometimes you mess up. You literally can't go wrong if people are watching you paint because there you are doing what you, doing what you do. I never was anxious after that about a demo, but... Um, Artists, you know, if I was in front of a, a room full of non-artists, that might be different, but artists so are my putting people. putting yourself out there. Putting yourself out there, entering competitions, yeah. open exhibitions. I mean, that's how I met David Curtis, really. Um, by entering my work into a, there's a magazine in the UK called The Artist Magazine, and they have an annual exhibition at an art festival called Patchins, and I used to enter my work into the... Um, Patchins, D David used to be a judge, he still is. I'm a judge now. <laughs> There's not many of us in the UK, we all do the same, <laughs> same jobs. Uh, yeah, but it was really funny. I remember when I first met him, and I was wearing a name thing like this, yeah. because I was an exhibitor. 
And David looked really busy. He was setting up his, he was in, a, in the guest marquee. And a friend of mine, another artist, said, oh, let me introduce you. And I thought, oh, no, he looks, you know, he looks terribly busy. And he was rushing back and forth. This is one of those cute little VW camper vans. Mm -hmm. And he was fetching his paintings. And I thought, it's not a good time. You know, when you, yeah, I'm quite sensitive. And I got the vibe. It wasn't a good time. <laughs> and he came, came out and said hi. And this friend of mine said, oh, you must meet. And he was sort of like, hi, but, you hi, know, but I'm, I'm busy. Yeah. yeah. And then he looked down at my name and he went, oh, and his whole demeanor just changed. Wow. I just shook my hand and he said, oh, I love your work. Your work's great. Because he'd been awarding me those prizes at the, um, for a couple of years at the exhibition. Wow. So, yeah, people have got to put their work out there. That's how things so happen. So, I, I, you know, people ask a lot, a lot about that. And, of course, we do our competitions with Plein Air Salon. And... I secretly enter another art competition. I don't enter my own because that would be silly, wouldn't it? Um, but I secretly enter another art competition because, I, and I don't care if I win. Awesome. I want to find out if I've got the chops or not. I want to find out if I'm going to become a finalist because I, what I've realized is that when you put yourself out there, your mindset changes. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how when you enter something for the first time or second time, what does that trigger inside of you in terms of how you think differently as an artist? Well, I think mindset's hugely important. Mm -hmm. You should not you, you should not um, you should not hold anything too heavily, right? So even when you do well and you succeed and you win a prize or you are elected to something, you know, don't don't make that over affect you either. Right. And when equally, when you don't get work in, you you don't achieve something that you wanted. It don't don't let it get to you because mm -hmm. it it happens to literally everybody. You probably all know Pete the Street. Mm -hmm. uh, he he's had his work rejected from the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition time and time again. I mean, we've all been rejected from stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think mindset's terribly important. You've always got to. We've always got to have hope, and there's always possibility and, and hope, but, he, but also you've got to keep a kind of an even temperament as an artist. Don't get too carried away with successes, and definitely don't get overly upset by... Mm -hmm. If something doesn't work for you, there's a, there's, a, there's a saying, isn't there, what's meant for you doesn't pass you by. So if, you know, maybe it wasn't your time, it wasn't your year, or it wasn't, you know, your competition, but there will be others. So. Well, I, I had a very famous artist tell me that there, there, he, he became part of a big competition. And, you know, you, we always just assume, because we've seen him there forever, that he's always been there, right? Mm -hmm. and, and he told me he entered nine years in a row, and every time he got rejected, he told himself, I, there's something wrong I have to fix. And so he would study his work more and he would be more critical of, of himself and he'd push himself. Mm. And each time that happened, he pushed himself more and he, he said that I was, I finally realized that I got accepted in because I wasn't ready those nine years before, but I was ready that, that ninth year, mm. right? And, and I think that the mindset thing is really important Super in the sense of when, when you're putting yourself into a competition, um, now you're not competing with yourself, you're competing with everybody else. In the sense of, you know, I, I'm mm -hmm. a judge, you're a judge, we know how it goes, we're looking at hundreds or thousands of images and images that are that tend to be iconic kind of stand out and they jump out and they go, wow, sure. look at me. Yeah. And that is a- Some you know, have more impact. They have more impact. Mm. And, and so learning how to do that and when you keep entering, you're like, now I, I have to try harder, push, push myself. Uh, Peter Adams at the California Art Club said that they had resumed, they had, used to have art competitions and they had stopped them and then they started them up again. And he said that the first year they did it, the quality wasn't all that good. But uh, 
each year they did it, the quality improved because people were pushing themselves up to higher level. And now the quality, you know, 25 years later, the, the quality is just so exceptional. Yeah. And that's why I think we need to, to enter these things and you need to put yourself out there like you said. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the other ways you, you do that? To put yourself out there? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that you go into events like this, yeah. um, making friends, yeah. uh, meeting people, connecting with them online, um, because you never know when you're gonna, who you're going to bump into and what. They might have some advice for you. Mm -hmm. They might tell you about a gallery in your town or something you didn't know about. So it's, it's, it's a great idea to be connected with other artists. So we have an art show out there in the hallway and I've seen some artists I've never known about and I'm taking pictures of their paintings and their and their name and sending them off to my editor and but saying but my name's here oh, you're it? not good enough yet um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll send them off to the editor and I'll say you know might consider looking into this artist and, and just some little things like that make there's some different. great work out there there's really there's some, some nice work yeah. out there yeah, so um, just just connecting with other artists, um, don't you know? Don't force anything, but just like as I say, I was always an introvert. But you you just gradually meet one or two new people each time you go to a new event. Yeah. I go to a plein air invitational. I might make two new friends. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and that's two and extra be, friends that, that they I could have. Be lifetime Absolutely. Friends. Yeah. 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 So if you were going to impart some wisdom on somebody who was maybe deciding to go down the path of trying plein air. Maybe they're listening to this and they've been thinking about it, but they're also like, I don't know how to do it. There's a big hassle, you know, there's mosquitoes and, and <laughs> raindrops and wind and you know, all, but what, what is okay. your best advice to somebody who is considering plein air? What's your, your advice on how to, how to get yourself out there, how to get yourself started? Plein air instead of studio painting. Yeah. Well, you know, if it's new to you, then join a local group. Because yeah. there, paint, there are painters painting plein air everywhere. As, yeah. Like you say, everywhere in the world. Um, so join, join a group and then you'll have a commitment to go out. Because we're the worst thing is thinking, oh, I'll do it next week. And I'll do it on, you know, and then oh, I'll maybe next week and just putting it off, isn't it? That's the worst thing. So um, if you don't have a group, maybe have a date in your diary and a time, and maybe put your paints in the car the day before. You know, just make it as easy for yourself as possible. Make a plan to go to a place, um, because I think that's the hardest part, is just getting out of your, your own house okay. and getting out there, yeah. So I always like to ask for a couple of tips. Oh. And you probably have a couple of pieces of wisdom that you try to impart on your students from time to time. Is there anything that you might leave us with that you think would be helpful to somebody to explore or try? Okay, so I would just say try when you're painting to listen to the little voice that's going on in, in your head and try not to name objects and, and just think in terms of shapes, values, and colors, okay. not trees, doors, fields, carts. Just listen to what you're saying to yourself because you need to see the subject as, a, as an arrangement of, of shapes, values, and colors mm -hmm. and not think about things too much. And the downside of thinking about things is? That you start rendering individual things maybe instead of making a coherent um, design, mm -hmm. making a coherent painting. We also have a tendency, I think, to tell ourselves because of kindergarten art class that <laughs> You know, a tree looks like a, a, tree is, a ball on a stick. And it's stick. brown and green. And yeah, or a sky is. And the beach. Or, you know, the sun has little rays coming out of it. And the sand is yellow yes. as well. That's another thing, isn't it? And, um, oh, I was going to have a good one then. And it's just completely gone. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I blew it for you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah there is that. Uh, you were saying about not naming things. Because oh, the reason, yeah, why not to name things? Well, anyway. Well, That's anyway. Right. It, it probably was not that good. Anymore. Probably it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, in my first book, Vibrant Oils, there's a bit about design and, and making no tans and just uh, coming up with a good, strong design that's got yeah. impact. 
Yeah. So doing some drawings. Well, so my other tip would be just to paint what you love. And uh, sometimes I ask a student, you know, what is it that drew you to this subject? Yeah. And they might say, well, I like, you know, there's these um, pots with flowers on the doorstep. I like the way that looks. And then I look at their painting and they've got the pots, the doorstep, the door, the windows, the first floor windows, the roof, the chimney. And I say to them, so why are you painting all that? All of that. So my other tip would be to, to think about what it is that particularly inspires you about that scene and think about maybe honing in on the thing that interests you rather than trying to take on too much. And sometimes we get like, we're in a new place like, you know, golden yesterday and sometimes we get visual greed and we see loads of exciting things. That's a great term. Visual, visual greed. greed and then you have to say to yourself, well, hang on, is this actually better as two paintings? Am I looking at two or three paintings here? Well, the which, wh which one am I going to? Yeah, so yesterday really? I'm painting on the bridge at the river with the mountain in the background and, and there's yeah, that rushing was nice. water and there's colorful trees, spring trees and I told myself, there are five focal points here. Right. Which one do I pick? Which one? Yes, exactly. Let's because not the try temptation to... is to put all five in there. And then you'll get a, the, me the painting will have a confused message. Yeah. yeah, it won't be clear what it was about. So. Well, this has been absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Thank Great. you for being on the Plein Air Podcast. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Lady hey, Joe Summer. <laughs> Thanks. We did this about four years ago. That's right. We have this. We have a nice interview already that we did about four years ago. Yeah, but it wasn't on video. No. Now we're doing Aww. it on video now. Ooh. Ooh. That's one Should've for me that. not to watch later. Should have worn YouTube. that white dress after all. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. 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 All right. This has been the Plen Air Podcast with Plen Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about plein air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at pleinairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at pleinairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.